Um, my name is Augusta Williams Jr. Look, uh, an international writer lives here locally, and we are in the Martin, Emma, Emma K. Library, that's Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Library down in uh, Melbourne, Florida, off of University, right down the street from the FIT College. And what make in all of Abar County, there's no road named after Martin Luther King, but there's an institution named after him, a library, a perfect institution, you know, for his background as a doctor and all his writings and speeches and his whole legacy. And I think across the country, there's very few institutions named after him. So we we get this, we have this proudly, and what, annually we have a fundraiser through the Friends of the Library to help uh, generate funds to the library where it comes short of the county funds and public funds. The Friends of the Library makes up for that. And this is one of the fundraisers of, it, of the library. And a fundraiser, you don't have to do anything, but if you generally, you want to uh, donate, there's the box right there you can uh, donate in. And I always add something for a $15 donation, you get a copy, a autograph copy of the book. For a $30, you take that home. But anything, even a penny, or uh, just your present is uh, welcome. This was a bad day. It's been bad all week, like Friday the 13 lagged on. And I was just introduced and informed by my cousin, it's the full moon. Uh, my main speaker, uh, long language. A uh, long time union and uh, advocated for justice. You know, rap acting, and he worked with all of them. He worked with King. He knew Jimmy Hoffa. He knew them all. He also was in World War II, the cameraman. If you've seen black and white pictures, still pictures of the movies, of MacArthur walking out of the water, that was he was behind that camera. He's 80 years old, and he just took ill. That's when he just came home yesterday from the hospital. He called me and said, Gus, I'm sorry I came. I'm okay, my body's breaking down. I'm sorry. But um, we'll see what happens. I, you know, I, I get, I'll talk to him later. I'll talk to him today. He's on my home, but I'm in the bed. So I, I lost him. I lost my preacher on the way here. He had an accident. He just texted me and said, I'm sorry, Gus. I'm in a fender bed and I kind of shook up. And he said, Oh my God. So I texted him. I'll catch him a rebound. I called you when when it's over, and he said, oh, you be prepared for Sunday, because he does the annual um, Black History Program for uh, Palm Bay off uh, Port Malabar at the Civic Center. He does that annual. He's been doing that for 10 years. And um, you know Robert Graham, he used to be uh, president of the NWCP a while back, and he just uh, turned it down. his last great thing, his involvement in the Trayvon trial. And he helped Daryl Washington. He was right on top of it. When Daryl Washington, uh, the guy from uh, Palm Bay High, the football player, he, uh, you heard about that about him. Yeah. And he stuck with him all the way to now he's honorated. No charges, but his career is ruined. Uh, they said he was part of a Hatchman Trophy candidate. Yeah. And that's sad, and he still got a bullet in his spine. So Robert was helping him with that, and he usually come to my annual thing and pray or do whatever he can to bring people, but he's not here today. So I always have plan B and plan two. So I got an alternate speaker by the name of Chris Holyfield. So he has done several films, maybe a more than a dozen films, and his um uh, he had an annual TV show on BT called Hell Day. And He's got a program that he go across the country to help uh, people that are in, in high schools and prison that uh, campaign against bullying. And I'll let him speak later. But now we're going to get started. Who say, can you see? Yeah. 
thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, also, the book is on Amazon and other network, all the networks, and a portion of that goes when it goes through my account to my lawyer. A check is written. A portion of that is written for the friends of the library. So that's another way you can support. If you go online, see all my stuff. Is uh, if you purchase it, you can read some of it free. Downloads three dollars, and I think the book it varies from twelve to fifteen, sixteen dollars. Catch it on sale. If you got special coupons, you can get it still. A portion of that goes to this library to help this friend. Hopefully, if I sell a million copies, she can get part of that. Maybe a hundred thousand or fifty thousand of that to go to the friends of the library. It will help. But that's the only thing the system really respects economic and leverage. And when we have our own economic and leverage, we write our own rules, just like the golden rule. He had the gold right write the rules. So yeah, my name is Roberta Ramsey and I usually uh, uh, I like to go to the library and look up scientific stuff and things like that. Uh, I'm always interested in the events that happen to our people and the slavery days and stuff like that and even though it happened here and you know we, we scattered all over the earth. So, uh, I look at the events that, uh, things that folks, that we try to do to correct it and bring us back into uh, a freedom that we can really enjoy our life. And, um, well, I've been to the military and I've been to many places. So, I see how people live and I see how we live here. And um, when I see things that happen here, it, it hurts me a little bit. I don't like the way it is. So I'm like you, want to straighten it out so that we can have a better life. Because there's so much out here in life to enjoy. You know, it's really don't have to have a lot of material things. Uh, the simple thing of life was good uh, for happiness. But uh, sometimes the overwhelming uh, uh, necessities of life is way over on one side and the other side doesn't have any. And then there seems to be a gap because I know myself, because I myself have to struggle every day. And instead of gaining a little bit, you're always going back. And when you do gain a little bit, you lose it. So it's always a long struggle. And it's a good struggle that um, we struggle in the Lord Almighty and uh, struggle in Christ. Uh, what the end is going to be, uh, the blessing will come to us because uh, we're, we're beautiful people and uh, we cut our loss across a lot of different borders. And but I'm from Panama. I was born in Colombia, Panama. So I'm, I came here when I was 15. So I'm just like you. <laughs> Thank you very much for letting me speak. Before we go on, I would like to um, announce Annie, one of the um, members, employees of this Martin Luther King Library. Just wave and say hello. Hello, everyone. Hey, and hello. I thank you all so very much for coming out, taking the time to partake in this. We truly, truly appreciate it. Our community needs this and more programs like this. I thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. I have another guest here. He's an artist. And if he if he has a story to tell, you stand up and wave. I kind of got all talents, your name. If you have a story to tell, come up and yeah. tell your story. He's done um, some work for the uh, the King Library and his uh, art is very good, and I like to recognize everybody. He, I talked to him briefly. He's got a story to tell, and he's got a mission, and you can tell your story and relay your mission. My name is Samuel Light. I'm uh, you know I'm born in Chicago, the first generation of my family to be born in the United States. <laughs> my family is from my boy Israel, and. Uh, my mission is actually to help our community uh, at least curtail crime, if not totally prevent it, by creating alternatives to crime with an organization that I have started in 2012 called HUD. It's Helping Others Obtain Dreams. This organization is designated to help individuals who've been on probation, parole, or in prison to find the proper proponents to get their lives back in order. I am and will be in the future, the very near future as a matter of fact, asking the people of this community to uh, help me to 
institute this organization here in Brevard County. Um, Mr. Mr. Williams, uh, Ms. Gwen Harris, and members of this particular library have been very fundamental in helping me do so. Uh, I did actually do a piece for the soon-to-be-retired Miss Estelle, I don't know her last name at all, Miss Edwards. And uh, it, it was a great pride that I did that. I wish I had the, the, the drawing here. But on the back table there, there's a, a copy of several of my drawings, if you care to look at them. And uh, I do uh, photograph restoration, old photographs of your grandparents, great-grandparents. I bring them back to their natural beauty. I actually do fantasy, I actually do fantasy portraits as well as you and your favorite star or historic uh, person and so forth. Uh, I also make one of the best cheesecakes in the world, so we, uh, don't worry about that. We, we, I, I do, I'm trying to, do, trying to arrange my own fundraiser uh, this March, which is the month of my birth. So we're going to be doing some great things. I want to be able to exchange. After spending 22 and a half years of my own life in the federal penitentiary, I just want to give back to the community. And uh, I've never been to Florida in my life. I've been to 16 countries and 47 different provinces, but I've never been to Florida in my entire life. And this is like the best winter ever. <laughs> Seriously, this is like the best winter ever for me. And I appreciate the opportunity to be able to give my organization a shout out, if you will. And uh, if anybody and everybody is concerned about crime in their community, people who want to, who know someone who's been to prison, on parole, can't seem to get the things back in order, my organization is designed to do just that. And it's designed from the point of view of someone who's been to prison. So all the barriers that they're going to face, I face them myself. And all these different things. So if you would take the time to take my email address, uh, I'm building a website right outside now. Just I'm on the I'm working on it right now today, so if we could get together and actually stop complaining about the things that's happening in our community and start doing something about it, that would be a one fantastic thing. Thanks for your time. For our main speaker, I'd like to briefly introduce. Uh, I met him about 20, 25 years ago. Uh, he was in the entertainment business then. He owned a nightclub called The Raid. I owned a business called Patricia Laundry Mat, a laundry mat that I named after my wife. And the reason I got it to help me travel when I wanted to travel and also fund my trips and my projects. And we got along pretty well. We got along great. My wife built his resume for him. So he was going, he was a professional wrestler, a real professional wrestler. He was a professional wrestler. He wrestled in school. What are the activities he did, I think he did football, but he's a, look at him, he's only four, four feet, a little over four feet, but he really 14 feet tall, and what he had accomplished, and his confidence, Amen. Yeah, and, and his confidence, in a great business and entertainment uh, era, he used his, uh, his shortness for strength, he not only uh, wrestled professionally and got paid, he was on the limpid weightlifting uh, team that travel around the world. He won gold medals and stuff. He still hold a record for, uh, I think, bench pressure. He only bench pressed 360 pounds, but it was three times his weight. No one said, I weigh two, 240. So I have to, to beat him. I have to bench press over 750 to beat him because that's three times my weight. He did uh, three times his own weight. He also was an actor, producer, uh, director, even a little bit of a writer in him. And I've announced before you know, some of his accomplishments, but his resume far exceeds what I elaborated to y'all earlier in the show. Far exceeds all that, and I'll let him tell you all about that. He also had a nonprofit um, organization that he owns that he goes around. Is, is, it's against bullying. It, and he goes to prisons and talks to people. He goes to uh, schools, goes to institutions. He goes anywhere. 
You know, I'll let him tell you that I think he went someplace and his cousin died. You know, his cousin died while he was on the sh was, was right on right on the one of his uh, campaigns. His cousin. I let him elaborate to you, brother. So that's a different story if he wants to do that. But uh, y'all remember Hell Day on B B E T? That's the star of Hell Day. And he did four movies for um, Luke Skywalker down there in Miami and 10 other movies and zillions of commercials. But to further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to introduce you to the song. And I'm just going to introduce him. Ladies and gentlemen, the fabulous Chris Holy. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I like the way Gus puts that together because Gus makes me feel colossal. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, I'm just Chris Hollyfield, um, a man on a, on a mission mainly for the youth. I started an organization uh, back in 2000, and what that organization does is called the God Respect Tour. And what I do is I travel to schools across the country speaking to students on respect and not bullying one another. Because most of the time kids are bullied is because of their visual differences. And obviously when you see me, as soon as I walk in the door, I'm visually different. So it gave me the upside. It wasn't a downfall. It gave me an upside so people to want to listen and be engaged. Well, uh, what's this little guy have to say? Well, prior to them getting to see what I had to say, I have a video they see to see my accolades. And then I come out to speak. And then when they see those things, I have somewhat their attention, if not all. But by the time I introduce myself, I have their attention. Because you only have about 30 seconds to a minute for the average audience. Either they're going to engage into you or they're not. So I've had the opportunity to travel across the country, even Canada, speaking to several students. But my uh, focus now is really trying to get um, a lot of local schools to bring me in as uh, like a mentor. And I don't want to do it with an, uh, through organizations for somebody telling me I have a psychology degree, because I don't. And if you ask me if I want to go get one, I'll be honest with you, I'm not. And not saying that someone that has a psychology degree is not worthy of that. I'm not saying those things. What I'm saying is that my approach is an approach that no one would know about unless you are 52 inches tall, which is four foot four. You won't know it unless you walk in my shoes. And you won't understand it until you walk in my shoes. And only I can express that unless someone is cloned to about my same height and has done the same things I've done to allow those kids to understand that, you know, it's okay to be who you are. And that's the problem with a lot of our youth today. And I like what um, Samuel was talking about earlier about the dreams because I've always been a dreamer. And a lot of times I dream so much that it gets me in trouble because, you know, because I keep dreaming and sometimes you have to go step aside from that dream that you have. But kids today don't dream no more. Because if you take elementary school kids, they're all happy. And they, they can tell you, hey, I want to be this, I want to be that. And some of them are a little far-fetched because some kids tell you they want to be a football player but don't play football. I haven't quite got that yet, but I, you know, I'm trying to figure that one out. And then they'll tell you they want to be a rapper and all these other things. Especially kids of, um, of our color, they have a tendency because of what they saw on television. They figured, like, because 50 Cent made it, I can make it. You know, I'm from the hood, he's from the hood. He sold dope, I can sell dope. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Things change. The way Luke Skywalker used to sell records down in Miami, from Master P to Cash Money to Jay-Z and all those, everything changed. But the young, young cats around and the youth, they don't understand that. They still think it's the same, and, and by doing that, they try to live that same lifestyle. And what they fail to realize is that most lifestyles are portrayed to seem bigger than what, they, what you actually are, so it looks good. Half the rappers out there, don't even, uh, they don't have a house, nor do they have those cars in their names. It's what that company, that record company has given them to so you look good, because if you look good, I buy what you have. And by them looking good, it's like, oh man, I gotta go get those because Lil Wayne has it on. But Lil Wayne is exceptional because 
he made $120 million last year, so that's totally different. But what I'm saying is like there's a lot of guys that are actually rapping and they're really not making a whole lot of money, but it looks that way. And it's just a perception. And our youth, they get caught up in that perception. And my thing is I'm trying to get these kids to understand that, you know, when you find that you love yourself and have respect for yourself, you can go a lot of way. You can go far. You can go far. And you won't have to worry about that person, whether it be a black person or a white person or any other race, find themselves walking around you because they fear you because of that look on your face. Just because of that look on your face. Because you've you have embraced the fact that you think this look right here. <laughs> it's going to make you a bigger person. And what it does, it's quickly to make you a broke person and a locked up person. And I try to tell you, so I said, smile. It's okay to smile because when you smile, People will embrace you and ask you, hey, can I help you? Because we all need help. Yes. So if you, if you, and I tell them this, I said, I wouldn't be where I'm at if people didn't open the door for me. And the reason why people open the door for me is because they said, you know what? This little guy, he tries. This little guy loves himself. This guy, this little guy has some sort of respect for life and people around him to allow those doors to open. But when that door opens, it doesn't open all the way. It opens just enough for you to get in there. But once you get in there, you got to get on the horses and, and you got to be able to do what you have to do to keep those things going. You know, I've never had an agent nor a manager. And I, you know, I had the opportunity to wrestle for the WWE, the largest sports entertainment company in the world, right here from Palm Bay, Florida. I wasn't born in Palm Bay, Florida, but I was pretty much raised in Palm Bay because I've been here since uh, high school. You know, 47, so that's, that's long enough. If I've been out of school almost 30 years, so that tells me that's pretty much how I was born and raised here. And that being that, the fact that I try to get these kids from University Park, Croton, and Sable, surrounding schools, and I try to reach out to even Palm Bay schools where I live at, and it's hard to get through these people's heads to see that the impact that I can have on these kids. Because when I walk into a, a school and these kids see me before, they go nuts. They go bananas because I sit there and I talk to them. I don't talk at them. I talk to them. I have a gift. And, I'm, and I, I'm, I thank God that I have that gift because I talk with them. And I let it be known that I'm not your dog, but I'm one of three things. I'm Mr. Chris, Coach Chris, or Uncle Chris. And it's funny to say, Uncle Chris, are you, you're my uncle. I said, I'll be your uncle all day as long as you have respect for me. So you have a choice to say one of those three things. So I try to get them to see that it's not where you're from, it's where you're headed, and what you, where your mindset is, and where you want to go. And I'm hoping this, this summer, I'm working with some people that have a, a camp here off of 192. A buddy of mine has a building. And um, we're working, to, working that right now. And it's not easy. I've, I've worked at camps, but trying to put a camp together to, and making sure it's funded is uh, so important. So I'm working uh, with some businesses and stuff to try to get some um, sponsorships through these um, businesses so I'll be able to provide uh, food and, uh, and great services for the, the youth of our community. Because I, I, I want to see more of the young youth dream, get back to dreaming. Because I've, I've worked in the systems of... Um, the juveniles, or because I've had, a, I've owned a group home before with troubled adverse kids, and to watch kids get in that much trouble, it's only based on. I don't really want to go and start pointing fingers at parents and grandparents and uncles. I don't want to do that. But I, what I want to say is that they're not going to get encouraged at school because the reason why they're not going to get encouraged at school, for the most part, is because teachers are tired, school board staffs, people, don't, they're tired because they want more money. So it's like they're on the verges of, I'm almost out, but I want a little more money before I get out. So with that being said, my mindset is not going to be the same when I first came into business. A lot of them are burned out. 
And then some of the rules have changed where, you know, kids feel like they can beat up teachers now. You know, and I feel like, you know, teachers, they should have, have people that work at the schools and a kid get that arm, snatch them up. Snap, just straight up snatch them up. Because what I see, as many videos I've seen on Facebook where kids beating up teachers over their cell phone. Well, if you look in that, man, that manual, it says no, no cell phones. But when they get the parents to come up there, oh, no, that's an iPhone 6. You know how much I paid for that? Nobody really cares. Because if you look, if you read the manual, <laughs> you would have said that no cell phones. So you, they try to go up against the rules. And it's just a lot of mixed emotions going on in the, in the schools and the youth today. And I want to play the role, whatever role I can play, you know, whether it be helping myself in my organization or anybody else to try to teach <laughs> You have to understand that, you know, life is beautiful if you play the game right. Life is beautiful if you play the game right. Because I fear every day that, say if one of these kids are in the third grade now, or by the time they're in the 11th grade, and they drop out, and they're not going to be over the head at the ATM. Because I don't think that's a far-fetched situation. Because I've seen a lot of youth just here in Melbourne alone go from the little kid that used to play Pop Warren football to the kid that's locked up, you know, at 15, 16 years old. I'm like, how did this happen? You know, where did you go from playing kickball, go, going down this marriage, get frozen cups to hold people up? And then it makes me think, where did, how did your mindset get to that point? You know where it happens? It's like, okay, the mindset has gotten to that point. It's because, guess what? When you dream, it's corny. Because my friend, my boys told me it was corny. Because you know you have a dream, and that's corny now. That's not cool. You know when you when you opt not to dream anymore because people told you it's not cool. Because the little crowd that you hang out with, you opt to do the things that they feel like it gives you street cred or some substance. And so I'm just hoping that through the summer camp that I'm working on this summer, and just keep being an advocate of. Like University Park is like one of my adopted schools and just trying to get the, the kids to, you know, be happy. Be happy. Nothing is nothing is easy. Nothing is easy. You gotta listen to this. Not you're not in charge. You didn't get disrespected. You you respect you disrespected yourself. And that's the problem. They don't they get respected, disrespected. So caught up to where they felt like, well, you supposed to say this. No, I'm not supposed to do nothing for you. You're a kid. You're supposed to abide by the rules. You don't, it's your problem. You want choices. Well, you, don't, you earn choices as you get older. And, then, and as you do the right things, you get choices then. You don't get choices because somebody told you, oh, I get choices all the I don't have to do that. Yes, you do. And that's the biggest problem. You know, they feel that they don't have to do things. And I, I hope that, you know, that a lot of things change because I, I, I've been here for a long time and I've seen a lot of cats from around here, you know, go to prison and it's just like, wow, you know, people make mistakes. We all make mistakes because we're human. Man, when you start making these mistakes and you don't understand them and you keep doing them over and over, it's no longer mistakes. It's bad habits. It's bad habits. Because you're going to forget your keys. Like your keys in your car more than three, maybe three times in a year. It's not like you did it on purpose. It was a mistake. But when people keep doing something over and over and over, and people told them, you, these are consequences. But you keep figuring like, you're always trying to buck the system and go around and see if there's a shortcut. There's no shortcut because I know this for a fact. Because I know my steps to your steps, man, it's a long, it's a long walk. It's a long journey from my steps to your steps. So I, I hope that, you know, like the situation here today and, and people can start to see that there's a lot of people out there that do care. And, and the only way we can, you know, keep building, uh, it takes some, uh, what they say, it takes uh, many, many people to build a village. And so, you know, it's just, I commend everybody, the few people that are here for being here because it's like, most people don't care because if it doesn't have nothing to do with me, it's not that important. But for, my, for myself, I have a two, two and a half year old 
And I think about like, wow, man, what did I do? You know, bring <laughs> bring a son that I did, and that always scared me. That it always scared me to have want to have a child because I always felt fear of those things. And now that I have a two year and a half year old, and I talk to him um, all the time, I talk, but you know it's very elementary. But I talk to him. The communication is such a key, and we lost that. We've lost that in society. We lost that in the, in the business world. We lost that with people. They just you got an email, put your email down, and I'll email it to you, and that's it. That's, that's it. You know, I don't have to talk to you. So through your email, I'm only reading what I I'm reading what I thought you said, but you didn't say that. You said you didn't want you know, uh, right now we're not hiring, and you know get back with us later. I'm reading uh, well maybe you didn't hire today, but you're going to hire me tomorrow. No, that's not what I said. We're not hiring. So we read it to something the wrong way, and that, that creates a lot of problems, too, because you get a lot of angry people. Because sometimes we read from right to left instead of left to right, not understanding what we read. And that's, what, that's a problem with a lot, of, you know, a lot of people. And so I just hope that you know, a lot of other people can come together and just start you know, really tackling this issue and make a difference because, you know, if, if not, things just get worse. Things get worse. And you know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, dreams do come true, but not overnight. Not overnight. I'm a firm believer that. And I can tell you, I left here in 1987. I was going, uh, I graduated in 86, went to uh, Palm Bay High and went to BCC, now it's Eastern State College. Went there first semester. I used to walk around and tell everybody, and all, all my buddies say, hey, man, I'm not going to be here long. I'm going to be a pro wrestler, and I'm going to sign autographs for every last one of you guys. So you better get it now because I'm going to sign autographs. And I used to tell them that, and, then, and um, people would say, yeah, okay, I hear you, I hear you. I said, no, trust me, I'm going to be on your TV. And it was, so I, I went off, and it didn't really quite work out. And I was back, so people, oh, what happened, what happened, what happened? I said, well, it wasn't my fault. It's just that I said it's the, the way the story I was told, and once I got out to Missouri, it was a totally different picture. I said, but trust me, it's gonna happen. I still kept moving. I still kept grinding and grinding and grinding and grinding. Twenty years later, I was forty years old when I got my biggest call. And I'm like, this is WWE. Hey, Chris. Yes. Oh, uh, this is the office of Vince McMahon. You know, you're like, no, you talking about the Vince McMahon, like WWE, like the real stuff, Monday Night Raw. <laughs> so, because you know, you start to, you you you, you, you start to, you know, you get you you, you get a little baffled, like, oh, small man, I ain't got time for games, and because you got shows on TV that punk you and stuff. So I'm thinking somebody's punking me. I'm thinking somebody's punking me. I said, well, let me let me do this. I said, let me call y'all back. I said, you sure you want to do that? I said, no, I just want to call y'all back, and make sure that this is real. So I called back. I said, all right, man, you finished? I said, yeah, 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 yeah. He says, hey, we want to bring you in. We're going to fly you into Seattle. I said, yeah. I said, well, I'm, I got to pay for that. He said, no, man, well, this is WWE. <laughs> this is how we do it. So when they said, well, well, if you can, go try to find a certain type of pants that we want you, we want, they wanted me to get. We'll re reimburse you, whatever you, you, know, you have to get. But, um, We'll send you an itinerary to fly out. Um, it's not guaranteed, but we're going to fly you out for one time. So I was with them for about 18 months. They never gave me a, a full contract. They gave me a week-to-week -week contract. Wish I would have had a, a full contract because, boy, <laughs> it would have been life-changing. Like, you know, just, that just never happened. But the whole point of it was is when I got that opportunity and then I was showing up on TV every, every Friday night and to walk into Chili's right there on Babcock Street and tell the bartenders, hey, can you turn that channel real quick? Yeah, that one right there. And that TV right there. <laughs> and that TV right there. <laughs> they don't let them watch it. Can you turn that TV right there? <laughs> and to sit there, and you know when you're, when you're about to come out, because you know the matches when they'll come out. I said, okay. He said, uh, what? I said, no, I just like wrestling. I just want to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the little boogeyman.
So my character name was Little Boogeyman, and um, I was the little sidekick to Big Boogeyman. So we came out, all that pyro, <laughs> we're doing our little, our little dance and everything, and I'm watching everybody in Chili's. <laughs> and you know, and, and you know, it was funny because everybody was like, hey, do you want something? What you want? You want something to drink? You want something to eat? You hungry? <laughs> it's just funny how quick people change when they saw you on TV. But I never changed. It only was a platform for me to be able to maneuver myself into things I wanted to do. Because when I became a motivational speaker, they're like, well, you have a degree. I said, I have an associate's degree in, in hospitality management. I said, I know that has nothing to do with psychology or anything of that nature. They said, so what makes you so good? I said, because I'm Chris Hollyfield and I know what it's like on the subject I'm talking about. I said, you can't do what I do. I said, I'm not taking anything away from you, but, I, but this is real. I said, oh, no, we're going to have our guidance counselor talk about it. I said, well, how often do they see her? Oh, every day. That's why the message is not going to be that important. Because they've heard her so much, whatever she says is redundant, and nobody wants to listen. Just like when we were kids, and our parents told us something. Oh, man, Dad told me that. I ain't getting on my nerves. Then you go down the street with the one of your friend's house, and the dad said the same thing, and you're taking it a totally different way. Like, yeah, Mr. Smith. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. He said the same thing. He said the same thing, but you took what he said to heart. But you kind of sidestep what your dad told you because he told you so many times. And when it gets redundant, we block it out. So I used to tell schools to say, oh, sure, let me show you something. I said, it'll never be the same. I said, when I finish, you're going to have to call 911 because the kid's going to be too hyped up. And you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna have to tie these kids down. And that's what, has, that was, that's what happens to this day when I go to wherever I go. Because when they feel what I'm speaking to them about, it's from the heart. It's not from a book. It's not because somebody told me I had to be there. And it's a, or I had that degree. It's because I want to be there. So in all in all, when I, when I say this, not every kid's gonna go to college. And when we're talking to some of the kids, let's not press, press a kid up to saying, if you don't go to college, you're not going to be anything. Because I, I don't like hearing that. I don't like hearing that because if you go to college, you have a better chance to move the decimal point on that check. You have a chance to move that decimal point on that check. Not guaranteed, but there's a big, there's a big percentage likelihood that you're going to be able to move it. You're going to be able to go from 8 to maybe $28 an hour. Possibility. Nothing's guaranteed. But when you break down a kid and say, hey, if you don't get an education, you don't get a degree, you don't go to college, you're not going to be anything. And why can't a person just be a hard worker, whether it be at Burger King, Walmart, no matter what, no disrespect to nobody to, for what they do. But why can't they just be good at that and make a living at that and just be productive people? But when you tell them what's not going to happen, just think about what's in the minds, because they're already struggling to stay in school, but you're crushing them when you're telling them that, well, if you don't go to college, you'll be on the streets. Do we actually know that? We don't really know that. Because for, for the best of us, some of us that got degrees struggling just no different than the person that, that's not. So it, it, it's like the things that we say, too, as adults, you know, we have to be very cautious on what we say and how we say it. Because I, I, I should have went back, but it was just school wasn't, school was a struggle for me. I wasn't that type of student. So I fought to like, I know I gotta do this, I gotta do it. And after the two years, I said, oh, man. And I was like, I'm gonna take a break. And I said, no man, you should still keep going. No, no, nah, nah, I gotta take a break. Cause that was, that was killing me. But because I wasn't that, I was a student, not a, a student that I cut up in a class, but I just wasn't that student, that kid that could study for a little bit, Oh, look at this. Take the test. A. Man, I studied for a whole week. Oh, you got a C plus. What? It, it, it was just that I, to, for me to retain it, a, a lot of stuff, it, it was just wasn't easy as it was for other people. And you have a lot of students like that out there. 
But when you tell them that, hey, if you don't go to college, you ain't going to be nothing. You're pushing them to the edge of saying, you know what, let me find a, a shortcut and a quicker way. So it's, it's all about how we, how we present ourselves to these youth. I know we feel that we shouldn't have to present ourselves a certain way because we're the adult, we're the elders, we, you know, we know it all because we've experienced it long enough. Yes, we do have that advantage. But two, we're dealing with a totally different generation that don't understand that. So we have to figure out to make our, our society a better society is a, how do we give it to them on the plate versus making it look as if if you don't listen to us, then you don't matter. Because I see a lot of that. So it's, it's, it's definitely the approach because um, I don't know if the, I think our texture and skin was a little tougher than them because it was just a better, different understanding because, you know, Miss Smith down the street can snatch me up without me telling, you know, I don't want, hey, you got to tell my mom this, all right? <laughs> this, this was enough right here, right? <laughs> you know, I tell her, I said, this was enough. I mean, I'm, I'm cool. I'm cool. And I can actually tell you who did this to me uh, from Melbourne. I can actually tell you who did this from Mr. Brothers. Mr. Brothers, um, Brothers Park. Mr. Brothers, he was my uh, American history teacher at Satellite High School. And uh, I was in his class. And uh, cause he always used to tell me the hallway, hey, don't get caught up. <laughs> you can't do the same things they do. Because I'm at Satellite High School, you know, all the white kids and everything. And, and he was just telling me, he was, it wasn't a prejudice thing, it wasn't a racist thing. He was just telling me, you can't do everything they do. Pay attention. You can't do everything they do. So I'm sitting up there laughing with them. He he and ha ha. Ha ha man. During the bell didn't ring and I'm still over there with them. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Go outside. So he took me outside. And it wasn't a matter, he wasn't concerned about taking them outside. He knew my dad was in the military. He knew, he, he was teaching me economics 101 about, hey, being a young black man. Yes. That's what he was teaching me. So he said, hey, you got a choice. Go to the front office. I said, that's not a good choice. Can't do that. He says, second choice. I can call your dad. I said, oh, that's definitely not even on the, uh, on the list. Bucket list or nothing. We can't do that. But dad said he can only come here to pick me up after school. Wrestling, practice, and um, teacher's conference. Those are the reasons why he can come pick me up. The, the, the reason why, if he comes pick me up right now, oh, there's problems. <laughs> now, and then when I get home, I said, no, nah, nah, I, I don't want to take that option. So what's the last option? He says, uh, go in there and sit you behind down. Don't be having no problems with you. I said, I like that one. I'm going to sit down. <laughs> My name is Chris Hollingfield, and I just want to appreciate, uh, thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to speak. But, uh, and that's a true story, Mr. Brothers. I'll never forget it. And I, and I love him today for this, and I always tell that because when he popped me, it was like, hey, well, we got a problem? No. Because I knew exactly where he was going. And when he said, uh, we can call you dad. So, oh, no. We, my dad only comes up here during the uh, teacher's conference after school practice and stuff. And he, my dad, got to leave work, come here? <laughs> no, nah, that's not working. You know, even though I'm from a different generation of kids now, yeah. but I'll call my mom, you know, whatever. But, Yes, that was my story, and, and that experience has taught me a lot. And um, I'm thankful that I, I, wasn't, so, I was, wasn't too hard-headed to have listened to people, to allow myself to do the things I've done in life. Thank you, guys. I have a lot of autographs. Thank you. I met a lot of famous people. But he was responsible for my autograph to Jamie Fox while he was still in the living color. That was his connection. His friend, when Jamie came down, he stayed, Jamie stayed with him, and he showed the time, and he introduced me to Jamie. Jamie read my poem. He thought it was fantastic, so I gave him three more copies of different poems. He said, this is going into my house, and he gave me a long autograph. I didn't bring it. Uh, this is just, ain't even 10% of my uh, archives of writing. I have over... I think 55, 65 pieces of work, 3,000 of it not even typed. You know, the half of it is typed. And the public, if any, only seen 70 pieces. Only seen 70 pieces of my work. And the rest of it is way, it belongs to my children. 
when I'm dead and gone, they will still pump out stuff from him to attorney, and I'm still writing. I'm still writing, adding to that uh, reservoir. And I teach writing, I teach people how to write. Not only for a commercial or anything, just for people just like to write for relaxation, for therapy, or communication. I used to teach little children, you know, how to, let's say teenagers, how to write to communicate to their parents. Maybe they can't really talk to their parents, but you can write a poem or a letter, stick it on the refrigerator, put it on the door of their bedroom, or put it on the stern wheel of their car. So when they come to it, they'll read it like you want to borrow the car and your mother dead set on not letting you happen. You think she's being too overbearing, but she got her own reasons. And when you're not there, there's a barrier there. When you talk to your mother, there's a barrier there. There's a gulf. I'm the adult. You're the child. Children should be seen, not heard, blah, blah, blah. And they're not trying to be, uh, you know, a tyrant. They have their reasons. It's like a captain on a ship, and they focus on the elements, and they focus on the pirates and all the other crowd. They focus on running the ground, hitting something they can't see. And, you know, they're up there driving the ship. They're not going to hit the rock. If they hit the rock, that's it. We're homeless. And, you know, they're like, it, son. I ain't got time. What? You going to what? No, no, not now. Not now. You know. But when you write, and later on we go to his cabin, he read the letters. What? What? Hmm. Then who knows? You might wake up and on the pillow is the keys. Be careful, son. Here's my number. Call me if anything. Accident, anything. Call me. Have a good time. You know, I trust you to be mindful. That's a trust. And as you teach people to do that, well, some people write and know what they're writing to be seen. Kind of like a diary. And I used to teach that to the University of um, the uni University of Dis Disney University, that's a school, that's a, high, that's a high school for outreach kids that got kicked out of school and on Chicago no one no more. But Disney, you know, have a way of doing to have a way of talking to them. Kind of like what Chris said, and I have many mentors from Dr. Brown to, um, I think I can't even think of them now. I'm, I must got all the time, but I had many mentors from school <laughs> teachers. A lot of my information, I used to be good with information. Now I'm 57 years old and it seemed like I crossed information, I get the date wrong, uh, get the artist wrong. Now that wasn't that, honey, that wasn't him, that was the other one, so my God. So I need to get with Gwen and see can some kind of recipe, because she's a vegan. She's a vegan and she said, part of, part of your diet, you know, part of that your diet. And then, you know, some of my uh, vegetarian friend and vegan friend said, you know, Mr. Williams, we gonna outlive you. I said, yeah, but not in the family. I don't want to outlive me. <laughs> not in the family. But you know, there's you know one thing I learned from her. There's a recipe for everything. There's a recipe. There's a recipe for everything. But you can't really say that because the medical people get on you. What are you trying to take our business? No, no, I'm just trying to help people. You know, just trying to help people. Just just passing information. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing, nothing wrong with passing information. Well, we're coming to the end of our program. The library going to close in over 55 minutes. I'd like to be out here before then. We'd like to thank everybody for coming. And we love you taking the time because you can be anywhere. You can do anything. It's Thursday afternoon. You ain't got to be here. You know, but you're here because you love education. You love institutions like this. And this institution is one we can call our own because all members of our county, when you want information, you know, information about us, this library, don't, if it don't have it, it can get it. And it's good to have an institution, you know, that represents us, our history. Thank you. God bless you. Drive safe.